do, do with better the channel. The mine be here. Steve, I think we were I think they were getting after that's all stable. by the county. This would be the surface of the Now look at how many thousands of cubic yards of sediment was stored in the bottom of the creek. Look at that's a temporary water table. Water's going back into the bank behind you coming in this way. So a lusher and lusher stand of vegetation can grow here. To slow the water down more, to have less energy in the, what we call the hydro period, the amount of time that water is available for the vegetation is longer. So grass plants that didn't have time to seed before. I'm going to go over and finish building my quarters on those two seed. structures. I'll wait for you over there, Steve. So okay. did I hear you correctly when you say when we get to this rock layer of deposit yeah. that there's more accessibility for water in that? Yeah. Every, because time, of the, every time we raise that, we make the stream wider. Uh -huh. Okay, so that takes okay. away power oh, I see from the running yeah. water. It, it okay. hasn't got anything to do with the way that we've got a rock layer and there's more access. For no. moisture in there. But Bill, weren't you referring to that cobble layer? Yeah, yeah we, right. Okay, if you look behind you, there's two main strata. It kind of depends. There's a strata made up of really big stuff. That's the heaviest and the speed moving. Then there's a strata made up of these large gravel or small cobble. Okay. Then there's a strata that's got a lot more clay in it, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, this strata, uh, in the short run, repels water. Uh -huh. I call it adobe creeks. Uh -huh. <laughs> because when there's a flood, the water just roars out of here and it hardly soaks into this at all, okay? But if we've stored uh, static flow, down here, then it soaks back into the gravel and it gets stored in the gravel layer to ease back out later. So it's more permeable in the gravel than the, the, yeah. the clay part. So, but the long term advantage is that once it's full to here and this clay zone is in contact with the stored water, then you get capillary action that wicks water up to here. <laughs> Okay, but it has to have a, a water body to wick from. Yeah. So it works yeah. like a, yeah. a dish cloth. Mm. If the dish cloth is on the edge of the sink and it's touching water, then the water wicks up and over and it drips on the floor. But until this clay layer is in contact with store water, this is like an electric switch that keeps water from getting to here. As soon as it's here, then the capillary action works again. So my method of erosion control yeah, yeah. and stream restoration works with three sciences. Geomorphology, which is the shape and dimensions of the creek, and where the power is and where the forces are directed. The second thing you work with is hydrology. That's how much water is moving, how long is it, and how, what speed is it moving at, how long is it available. And I'm mostly concerned with how long it's available, not how much it, there is. Okay. Uh, and then the ecological characteristics of the vegetation. So as the vegetation moves in, it creates roughness, which slows down the stream, which changes the stream power, which allows more water to stay longer, which allows more vegetation response, which modifies the morphology, which modifies the hydrology. And so the, the species composition of what can live and grow here changes over time, okay, which further manipulates the morphology. So this is a this is an art of three sciences, geomorphology, hydrology, and ecology. And truly really the regenerative process. Yeah, so you blend it, but, and I say let the water do the work because the water's gonna erode this bank and it's gonna bring this stuff here and it's going to sort it out and put the biggest pieces on the bottom and this, 
medium size in the middle and the clays on top and the vegetation going to hold the clays because they just go on downstream as muddy water unless there's vegetation to trap and hold it. Okay. How, how quickly, I, um, after you've set up some structures like this, uh, after a storm event, do you get to see some of this? You see change the first like storm immediately. Yeah. So you can assess if, where, where you maybe improved yeah. or made mistakes. Okay. Or? So that's a great question because then we monitor, <laughs> and monitoring does two things. Are we on track with respect to our overall goals for the creek? Are the structures in the right place? Yeah. Did we screw up and put one where it didn't belong? In which case, maybe we have to either modify it or take it apart and put it where it belongs. Uh, or also, we just monitor for the integrity of the structures. So maybe the creek went around here, we need to put a rock right here. You know. Now, with the baffles, like this one, have a little trouble here because this particular lens or layer strata has got a binder in it and it's going to have to soak for a long time before it comes apart. You see what? This is soft up here but this is hard and it's like concrete, a weak concrete. So anyway, we don't watch to see how fast this bank is giving away, okay, and how fast the uh, point bar is forming right here. This is where the point bar is forming. Right here. Okay. This will all be deposited material, and there'll be deposited material in between the rocks there. Okay. So when we monitor, we would. We might decide to, if this, if, let's assume this bank dropped back like it's supposed to, and this concrete doesn't be the progress. Then we would want to have, keep the pressure on the receding bank, or I say chase the receding bank. We can do that by simply adding one row of rocks along this downstream edge and coming out one rock farther. Mm -hmm. That changes the radius of curvature on the whole bank. We don't have to leave out this whole structure. Just go out a little, just pinch it tighter? Yeah, just pinch it. And we can speed up the process sometimes by actually taking a shovel after we build this and dig this out a little bit. So we, you know, help the creek do the work. It's not cheating. No, it's not cheating. <laughs> So I understand. I make up the rules as I can. <laughs> the baffle placement makes sense to me if you're looking at the like the meanders that are starting. But what about the one rock dam placement? How do you know where to set those? They go up? basically halfway between. The Just baffles. between baffles. Yeah. At what and that's catching it. sediments that yeah. it carry. And the bigger the flow of the stream. Is there, what adjustments do you make? Okay, in okay. well, I've, that's the, the great unknown hmm. in this part, is I don't know when it's going to rain next, and I don't know how much it's going to be. <laughs> so I keep my fingers crossed that the first one is moderate, and it packs lots of sand and gravel in among these rocks and kind of helps hold them in place. If the first one is this deep, maybe we've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> And it might blow them out. Yeah. And if it doesn't rain for three years, nothing changes. Yeah. You get a little right. wind erosion. Mm -hmm. and some mm -hmm. stuff. But cool. So, Bill, on, on this baffle too, I'm curious. Um, do we want the bot the downstream course to be set in an anchoring trench, so that they're flushed with the bottom of the basin, just like a one rock at yeah. the bottom? A one rock dam. They scrape this out, so. Hmm. So, okay, so the sediment in the bottom of the creek is the best analogy I've come up with is, you know, the moving sidewalks at the airport. Okay, so we jump up the creek this way, the bed, this way, the fly close. Okay, so this is a stuttering movement, though, when it's not raining, this stuff is not moving. This bed would look essentially like it does now, with all the pieces.
part of the tree that's firm. So see the moist, moisture soil. So the real bottom of the creek is down there someplace. Where you're hitting moisture? Yeah, well, bare rocks. When I get to this. So that a, a creek, when it's moving, is not just water, it's a stew. Mm. Okay? And the stew is made up of things that dissolve in the water. You don't even see them. And then it's clay particles that are so tiny that they only settle out 10 inches in 24 hours in still water. So if they're once in and we call that the wash load. If they're picked up by the moving water, the next stop is Tucson, you know, uh, or whenever it dries out and leaves them behind. So you can't hold clay particles except with vegetation, okay? And then the next size is the sand, and the sand is part of the bed load, and it keeps moving along as, as long as the water is moving. So that tends to fill up all these holes. Okay, and then the next size is the gravel, and the next size is the cobble, and larger pieces. But they drop out in reverse order of their size and density. Some rocks are heavier than other rocks for the same volume. Mm -hmm. okay, so that creek doesn't pick them up and move them very far. And the best analogy on that is they move like uh, the air going across an airplane wing and lift, okay? So we get lift that picks this rock up, but as soon as it picks it up, water flows underneath and that cancels. There's the water stream across the top and it drops it. So this rock hops down the creek, if you would, in the storm, okay? Keeps getting picked up and tumbled. I've had rocks this big move 140 feet. In a big enough storm that same way. Grand Canyon moves a few. Moved a few. <laughs> when you talked about appropriate uh, curves in the stream, how do you determine that appropriate? Okay. Well, it's going to be hard for this stream to reach the potential, okay? But the stream itself tells you when you've done enough. And we call that sinuosity and for a given landform and size of watershed and the grade of the slope, uh, there's an appropriate meander. Or sinuosity. sinuosity is the grade of ratio of the uh, valley. This, the stream distance divided by the valley distance, the straight line distance between two points. You measure the stream distance and then you measure the valley distance and you divide the valley distance by the stream distance and that gives you a, a number which is the sinuosity. Okay, as sinuosity increases, the velocity of the water slows down. Okay? but it's still the same amount of water coming at us, right? Here it comes, it's just moving slower. Okay, so if in the going around the bend uh, takes time, here comes all this water. So if we've made the bend too big, the water gets impatient in the ponds right here and it takes a shortcut. At that point, you put all the meandering into this creek and get away with it. <laughs> okay. okay. Because the water is not going to have any patience with you if you try to overdo it. <coughs> so the more floodplain has got to spread out on, the more patience it has. But well, so then whenever you keep these baffles, theoretically we get more and more senior money. Water and streams that I, I've got to get out of here, so it cuts a new channel through each of these. We've got a straight creek.
that. It's kind of that new channel, mostly in response to the mismanagement of what's been imposed on the landscape, whether it be grazing or roads or whatever. It's like, because you're putting more water into a channel in a certain way that it naturally wouldn't flow. Oh, is that right? Plus you've lost the cover. And you lost the cover because the grazing or whatever is right. So, so the water's just trying to find its new path based on the new conditions yeah, and that have been imposed. Yeah, there's a lot more of it. Right. In, in short, you know, it's not more in total. More concentrated. Pastures, more concentrated. Right, because it's not being able to sink in naturally because of the right. organic matters not right. in the landscape mm -hmm. and stuff. Yeah. So good. if something like that happens, is that just like a disaster? Because all, all the work that you put in is now just a straight creek again. Yeah. But you can it's fix it. probably, you know, doesn't cut down to right. this right. original so, depth. Yeah, so, so you can re remedy it. Yeah. And Bill Britt was asking earlier um, why this is needed in the first place. Like, why are we here? Why are we here on this site? Why are we doing this here? Well, and maybe, Britt, if you want. It's pretty obvious that the landscape is pretty great. This is like a and, wound. And what was the cause? Yeah, the first yeah. What was the cause? Yeah. Well, there's, there's, there's two, maybe three. There's a main cause for the whole Broly wash. Is that it went from being a giant cyclotone cyanaga from top to bottom, and it was heavily grazed because it was a resource. And then they put in some dams to use for irrigation to irrigate the terraces, and there was a big storm. Nathan Sarah wrote this up by probably gobble, gobbling, garbling the facts here. Hmm. But there was a big flood around the turn of the century, and that reservoir dam broke, and the flood roared down the valley and down cut the main channel. Okay, so once the mother channel or the main channel down cuts, all the tributaries down cut to that level. That's a rule. Okay, and in the meantime, there was little grassy cover on the landscape because of the advance of the grazing. Uh, and I'm not anti-grazing, I'm not coming across, but they got to be managed right. And they're managed for the health of the grass. And uh, you think of the cow as being the, the lawnmower to keep the grass healthy, mm -hmm. or the lawnmower that, that's, that's got the digging right. <laughs> tool on it, one or the other. Right. Okay. That's a lousy analogy. I wish it didn't work all. Okay, uh, and then the ro the landscape is crisscrossed with roads. He's right down below Okay, here. and the old roads, wagon road, wa horse and wagon era, in lots of ways was tougher on the countryside than vehicles hmm. because those big Rats. wheels had iron rims and they cut. Too. trenches and the easiest way to go up and down a valley was in the grass along the creek and those ruts mm -hmm. captured the water and it was straight so the water ran faster in the ruts than it did in the creek and then every once in a while you had to cross, cross the creek so here's this channel built by the roads that captured the creek and mm -hmm. down to the main wash mm -hmm. okay and now the roads do the same thing and every time the road crosses the creek, it kind of cuts it out a little bit, okay? And then there comes a flood and the water drops off that rim and causes a head cover to go chugging up the valley. So coming up through here, if you look at these, we could look here again at this. Oh, uh, mesquite tree. This mistake tree was started growing here. Yeah. Okay, all that soil is gone. That Palo Verde tree has got the same kind of. Uh, so I, I think there was no streams here at all. This was a big flat plain with just sheep flow coming across. About how long ago? Oh, uh, less than a hundred years. So, so just some little rivulets or something. Yeah, something. braided. Rivulets that crossed each other. Right. Never okay. Built that momentum. And they had a deep zone of clay that was sub irrigated naturally from below, kept it moist and could support vegetation. Nice. So when this dropped 
we lost our capability, then it all dried out, and then the fines washed away, and what was a clay sub A layer, A horizon on this is all gone. Okay. Well, there's a, isn't there a, a thing about how streams in this northern hemisphere move sideways they over move time? sideways. Anyway. Or, anyway. But is there... Um, how do you account for the... How do you work with it when you know they're, they're going to be moving off to one side? I, I really don't think that's true. Uh-huh. They, they move, they carry stuff downhill uh -huh. towards the sea. And there's, as, as I, I just explained what regulates the amplitude of the meander. Right. Okay. Once the water's running so slowly, that it's uh, backing up, then it tends to move back in that direction and cut off the obstruction, which is the point bar. Mm -hmm. you know, there's, I've never read uh, a convincing discussion of why streams meander or why smoke columns meander. Mm -hmm. You, you, you say know, you've never for, read? No, and, and smoke if you column? read Luna Leopoldi's and the, he says there's never been a good explanation for meandering, but it's a fact. <laughs> he, even uh, the Gulf Stream meanders across the Atlantic Ocean, and you can sometimes see it from the air because of the difference in the water color. Mm -hmm. But it's still meandering where the, mm -hmm. you know, where the defined meander length and amplitude, mm -hmm. and it can be recognized, well, it in the and it meanders in three dimensions, right. not just two. Right, and when it does its, the, the, um, the vortexing, right, it's the, is that the Bar, Bar Carmen vortex, is that what it's called? I forget what it's I called, but it's the one, you know, where the, it naturally slows itself down and speeds itself back up, and it's kind of like the imprint of, the water has that self-regulating device, so it kind of wants to slow down and then speed back up and then slow down, but how to explain that, yeah, it would be a good... No, I can't. <laughs> I'm not a good enough good. physicist. <laughs> the mystery and the a, wonder of water. Right? I, I worked with a <laughs> result, not yeah. a... Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Yay! <laughs> Thank you very much. I hope that some of it made sense. But yeah. <laughs> yeah so, so, Bill, just as we move forward and uh, help build some of these structures, um, uh, could you just cover the, like what are the main points we want to make sure we get when we do a one rock dam and we do a baffle like yeah. elevation of rock Same slope the bottom row needs to be dug in a little bit because of what i just showed you because we're going to get scour and if we don't dig it in it's going to get washed away yeah. i kind of want a smooth surface so we have streaming flow especially on the baffles if we have streaming flow without turbulence we'll get a lot will have sediment deposited among the rocks and in this point bar that's going to form down here. But if we have one big rock that sticks up above all the rest, then we're going to have turbulence around it and that'll speed up the flow and create uh, a scour pool and move the sediment on out. We, it won't, it won't uh, collect. Okay, so that's one thing to look for. Uh, the structure needs to be about twice, a minimum of twice as long as it is wide. This is the width, that's the length, this is the hypotenuse. Okay. Uh, so it kind of levers the water into the opposite bank. If I stuck a structure like this straight out and tried to bulldoze the water into the bank, it's coming out on this side with lots of turbulence for an eddy pool. Or if you've rafted uh, Colorado or something, and you go around a big rock, what happens? <laughs> you get slammed into the bank. So we're yeah. we that. Okay, so we need to. Okay. Uh, we're going to do a decent job of uh, stone masonry so the rocks are nicely abutted against each other uh, so they support each other. My analogy to that is uh, the soldiers in a Roman platoon, you know, everybody's got a different kind of uh, weapon, but they're all 
you know, shoulder to shoulder, several rows deep, so they're protecting each other. You don't have one little stone out there by himself trying to, you know, ward off the creek. Uh, or another analogy might be the linemen on the football team. You know, they're shoulder to shoulder too, and they give each other strength. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If we just toss them in, we don't have that effect. And so I like to try to chink between the stones because that speeds up the rate of deposition later. With the little stones. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So in terms of worrying about any angle, if we just make sure we've got the length twice that of the width, yeah, at least twice. and sometimes the particular site, you know, doesn't allow for that. Okay. Do you want a continuous slope from the anchor rock at the point up to the bank? Yeah. Sort of have that here. So would it be more advantageous if that puck on the corner was actually sloped just a little bit? So that Again? this rock on the corner, if it had... If no, I worry about that being stable. Just stable. Yeah. So it's okay if there's a little bit of a rise yeah. from it, just as long as it's stable. About how much of this rock is down here? About 50%? No, probably 25%. Oh.